Hello, and welcome to a presentation on oil spill bioremediation, bioaugmentation, and biostimulation enhancement. The presenters for this presentation are Amanda Williams and myself, Justin Angel. So let's get started. Oil spills can have negative environmental impacts both short-term and long-term. Chemical toxicity on the environment means chemicals within the oil spill area are absorbed into the tissues of plants and animals and could create both non-lethal and lethal effects depending on the chemical. Crude oil can contain mercury, nickel, benzene, toluene, and many more toxic substances. Other problems that can occur are physical smothering of organisms, ecological change, and also other indirect changes. Oil spills can be remediated by bioremediation, and bioremediation can be enhanced by bioaugmentation, biostimulation, or a combination of the two. In bioaugmentation, single strains mixed cultures with or without genetic engineered organisms are added to the site of interest. The purpose is to introduce more or a different microbial species into the environment to better reduce the oil than the natural flora can achieve. Biostimulation refers to the addition of nutrients and electron acceptors such as nitrogen, oxygen, or phosphorus to name a few that may otherwise be acting as a limiting nutrient in the biological degradation of the contaminant. Bioaugmentation with additional bacteria may become necessary in some cases. Even when bacteria capable of remediating an effective site are present, an inf insufficient population of microbes may be present and therefore cannot break down the amount of oil. Because of this, oil may persist for decades, especially on the shoreline. Even if there is a sufficient population, components of oil may still persist because the species present are not capable of breaking down all of the chemical components of the oil. In other instances, the site may be entirely lacking in bacteria capable of degrading oil. When planning for the bioremediation of an oil spill via augmentation, many factors need to be considered as to not waste valuable time, money, and resources. The chemical composition of the oil must be taken into account as some species may break down only some chemical components of the oil, such as alkanes. The concentration and physical state of the oil is also important. Even oil degrading bacteria cannot break down a toxic level of oil. How to successfully inoculate the site with bacteria if using a culture and what the ramification might be if the culture becomes the dominant species are also things to consider prior to beginning a remediation project. One option for bioaugmentation is using a single strain of microbe, culturing it and introducing it to the affected site so that it can degrade the oil at an enhanced rate. In studies, trends show that this is often more effective in the beginning of a remediation treatment, but rates of oil decomposition soon become what they may have been naturally without the addition of larger populations of bacteria. Even when the strain being used is one taken directly from the affected site and cultured with the same, the same pattern continues to emerge. This early high efficacy is probably due to the large population at introduction, which then rapidly declines in number before settling. Microbial consortium populations, which consist of more than one species, may also be used. Using multiple species allows for higher metabolic diversity and enhanced degradation rates. This can be beneficial as there is evidence that many oil degrading bacteria may only break down certain chemical components of oil. These cultures are made in bioreactors, but even with their diversity, it can still struggle when used in situ, even when they are successful in lab-based trials. This may be due to varying environmental factors, such as pH changes, temperature changes, water availability, and even oil concentrations that have reached toxic levels to the bacteria. So which works best, a single strain or a consortium? Both can work successfully, but the culture must be highly adapted to the affected environment which can be a problem with some commercial cultures that don't use strains taken directly from the target treatment site. In this case, non-native species may not be able to outcompete native ones long enough to break down the oil spill. Steps can be taken to increase treatment success when using cultures, and even with successful lab tests, environmental seeding may still fail. Sometimes, an added food source, such as through the process of nutrient augmentation, can help to increase the chances of the culture surviving. Another way to increase success is to use a species native to the site that has been hand-selected for augmentation. This strain can be cultured and then reintroduced, and studies show that they often survive more successfully than their introduced non-native counterparts. One mesocosm trial 
showed an introduced consortium was able to outcompete the native species so that they could successfully remediate a habitat, but it was unknown what the future impact on the community would be. Table 1 shows a list of some of the factors affecting the success of bioaugmentation based remediation that must be taken into account. Notice that much of the chart shows environmental factors causing failure, such as pH, temperature, and moisture. The other major issue is problems during and after inoculation, which explains why even if a trial runs smoothly in a lab setting, it may not work well at the targeted site. Commercial products are another alternative for site inoculation that they still need to be considered based on the site and oil remediation requirements. The culture will need to be extremely robust and capable of surviving many habitats and environmental issues if the culture is not tailor-made to the site. Some research has even demonstrated that after testing commercial cultures on contaminated soil from Prince William Sound, it was discovered that native bacteria was still degrading most of the oil. Finally, one of the more advanced methods of approaching bioaugmentation is to use genetically engineered strains and plasmids. Genes have been isolated and cloned for the ability to degrade oil and have been engineered into strains used in remediation projects. Problems with successful completion of these projects likely come from the stress of foreign DNA being inserted into the culture, but there are other methods of introducing genes. One novel idea is the use of plasmids that contain the oil-eating gene and introducing these to native bacteria at the target site in hope of the bacteria picking up the gene, expressing it, and going on to degrade the oil. As promising as these techniques may be, it remains to be seen whether public opinion will allow for widespread use of the technology if perfected. Biostimulation is the addition of nutrients to the environment to promote microbial growth. These nutrients can be divided into two categories, macronutrients and micronutrients. Macronutrients consist of nutrients that are required by the cell in large quantities and include nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Potassium, calcium, iron, and magnesium are considered macronutrients as well, but are not required in such large quantities as nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Macronutrients are most often used in creating the cell structure and performing cell metabolism processes. Oxygen can also be considered macronutrient because the degradation of oil and water is most commonly performed by aerobic bacteria. These, the microbes used in the oxygen as an electron receptor in cellular respiration in the degradation of the hydrocarbons. Carbon is also considered a macronutrient for cellular growth. In oil spill remediation, the oil or hydrocarbons act as the carbon source where the hydrogen atoms in the hydrocarbon are also necessary to maintain pH balance and the hydrogen provides free energy for the proton motive force that produces ATP in cellular respiration. Micronutrients or trace elements are only required in small amounts by the cell and are used in enzyme function and protein structure. These nutrients consist of many inorganic molecules such as manganese, zinc, nickel, cobalt, and many other trace minerals. Limiting nutrients are nutrients that are not in high enough quantity within the site for the microbes to fully or quickly enough degrade the oil. When an oil spill occurs, microbial communities that can consume the oil will begin degrading but may not be able to fully reduce the hydrocarbons to carbon dioxide because the microbial population is lacking vital nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus for continued growth. The most common limiting nutrients added for biostimulation in oil spills are the macronutrients and more specifically oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Biostimulation can be performed either in situ or ex situ. In situ being injecting the nutrients into the environment and ex situ being the process of removing the contaminated soil or water, treating it outside of the environment, then replacing the soil or water back into its original location. Gaseous nutrient injection is an application used where oxygen is a limiting nutrient. Bioventing is the most common method for oil spill degradation in soil and groundwater. Bioventing provides a very low airflow to not disrupt or scour the environment. The goal is to reach a desired oxygen content within a contaminated site that is necessary for the microbes to fully reduce the hydrocarbons to carbon dioxide. Oxygen enhancement can also be achieved by injecting liquid hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is readily converted into oxygen and water in the environment, thus yielding higher oxygen content 
within the areas of injection. However, hydrogen peroxide can have negative effects on the microbes required for the oil reduction, so a pilot study prior to injection would be the best way to determine how much hydrogen peroxide should be added. Nutrient slurry injection is the most common biostimulation practice and refers to the addition of nitrogen, phosphorus, or any nutrient that may be limiting microbial kinetics. Common nutrient products include mineral salts, salts such as potassium nitrate, sodium nitrate, ammonium nitrate, potassium phosphate, or any commercial garden fertilizers such as a 23 to 2 nitrogen phosphorus fertilizer that was used in the Exxon Valdez case. For the marine environment, the typical application of nutrients is with a spreading of soluble granules or a slurry spray. Each remediation site is specific in the amount of nutrients needed and the particular ratios of nutrients required, but laboratory results have shown that the optimum ratio of microbial deg degradation of oil is with a 100 to 10 to 1 carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. Also, the compound in which the nutrient is found depends on the environment. For example, the addition of nitrogen could be through potassium nitrate or ammonium nitrate. There are also options on the type of nutrient, that is water-soluble, slow-release, or oleophilic. Water-soluble compounds are typically granules and are readily ava available for microbial uptake, and the ratio of nutrients is easily achieved, And but these water-soluble compounds have a high potential for washout. Slow-release nutrients could be a better choice depending on the environment, particularly in high washout areas and a lot, with a lot of tidal movement. These nutrients consist of a hydrophobic outer layer, which is usually vegetable oil. Slow-release nutrients provide a continuous source of nutrient, but the rate at which the nutrient is released is difficult to control. Oleophilic nutrients are nutrients dissolved in oil. These nutrients adhere to oil so they are at the oil-water interface making them readily available to the microbes. However, this nutrient method is expensive and contains hydrocarbons in itself that could compete with the oil as a carbon source for the microbes. Some biostimulation is important to know as much about the environment as possible so that the biostimulation efforts do not disrupt the current ecosystem with eutrophication of waterways or out of control microbial growth populations in areas that may be sensitive to microbial community changes. Biostimulation has been proven to be a successful bioremediation enhancement effort and with new te technologies such as oleophilic nutrients, it can become an even better bioremediation technique for oil degradation. I will now turn it back over to Amanda. Thanks. Oil has been treated in bioremediation trials by either biostimulation, bioaugmentation, or both processes concurrently. The mesocosm scale trial mentioned earlier tested whether nutrient stimulation, single species bioaugmentation, or consortium augmentation would be the most effective for the treatment of hydrocarbons. This trial demonstrated biostimulation had little effect of oil degradation efficacy or efficiency but interestingly showed no change in dominance of species, but then later post-trial showed greater um, biodiversity. This was very different from the bioaugmentation trial which changed the community composition over time. This exemplified a previously mentioned concern of that possibility. The scientists from the mesocosm trial and from other research we read came to the same conclusion that a combination of bioremediation strategies would be most effective. We came to the following conclusions after reading varying research. The characteristics of the target site will greatly influence the techniques used for bioremediation. This is mainly due to varying environmental factors such as pH and temperature as well as other species in the environment. Bioaugmentation seems to lead to more efficient oil degradation, but only if indigenous microbes are cultured and used as opposed to non-native microbial species. Both techniques have their issues when used individually, but a combination of strategies may be the answer. Using a combination of bioaugmentation and biostimulation may allow for more oil to be broken down as it will be easier to break down difficult to degrade chemical components of oil.
Overall, both techniques show great promise for oil bioremediation and can serve as an alternative to more environmentally damaging techniques, such as the use of dispersants. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to your questions.